On a downtown Toronto street, the everyday world of Canadian teenagers meets the Never Never Land of network television. Here, fantasy collides with teenage realities of the 80s, from AIDS to zits. This is backstage at the most famous school of awkward adolescence in the world, the Grassy Junior High. <laughs> Growing up on Degrassi has been so different and unique. We all know each other very well. We tell each other our secrets and yeah. things like that. We've captured our teenage years on film. I mean, the amount we've changed from the time I was 13 to the time I was 16. It's a great way. It's incredible. The winner is Degrassi Junior High. Ken Lloyd and Linda Scott. November 1988. For the kids' show that graduated to prime time, a stunning sweep of national awards. Degrassi picks up four Canadian Geminis, including those for Best Dramatic Series and for Best Actor, Pat Mastroianni. You're in my seat. Any seat? Uh, I don't see a name on it. Arthur. Don't make me mad. Okay, okay. It looks like a real school. The hallways and all the sounds and all the school bells. It's just a real school because it's not a set. This is a real school where we film. The Degrassi Schoolhouse was created by producer Linda Schuyler, a former teacher, and director Kit Hood. Twelve years ago, they formed Playing With Time Productions, gathered a company of 52 young actors, and began making television from a kid's point of view. You know, it's great to be back here. Their idea was that kids' TV could have a funny bone and still deal with the tough, tender issues of growing up. For the most part, there are no subjects that we say are taboo. I think it's very important that sexual matters, deaf, um, whatever are the human emotions and experiences that are liable to confront all of us as we pass through ages and stages in our life. As long as it's discussed in a, in a healthy and wholesome manner, I don't think there's any topic that can't be discussed. She takes care of Emma during the day, and then at nighttime I take care of her baby. That's why I can never go out anywhere. There's a lot of shows on TV that have teenagers, and the teenagers run around and they do their hair and file their nails, and chase boys and, and worry all, about their zits and, and <laughs> that's all they do and that's not that all teenage life is like and people you can't it's good that there's something realistic on tv sometimes degrassi is so realistic it hurts joey shops for condoms for a disastrous first date melanie fears she's too flat-chested for the swim team snake finds out his brother is gay and lucy is caught shoplifting Take the bag, Degrassi's head writer, Jan Moore. Kids make a lot of mistakes, and kids experiment a lot. Kids get caught a lot, and sometimes they don't get caught, they get away with something, but it costs them in another way. So there are, there are consequences. My friends watch it, they tell me, they say um, that the show is really good because they don't find an easy way out. They tell the kids, or they at least try to help the kids with them with those problems. And, and they give the and they give the kids choices. Like they're not telling you you have to do this if mm -hmm. this and this happens to you. They give a variety of choices, and the kids can learn from these different from the different choices, or they can decide. Look, well, I'm sorry. I was dumb. I have to go to court. I guess I'm in a lot of trouble. Like, some days it's nice to watch a TV show that has no basis in reality and it's really floating. You can think, wouldn't it be nice if life were like that? But also, realism is really good, too. Like, And it's not all heavy. Like, as you can see, Degrassi's a funny show. It's not like, well, she has epilepsy and she's pregnant and, you know, he's in a coma. It's not always heavy issues. There's a lot of humor mixed in. I've got a friend who's 12 years old. He gets a lot of wet dreams. Is he a pervert? I'm not a pervert. You're a chicken is what you are. In this series, we try to give as many kids going through as many experiences just to say to these other kids, you're not alone. It's, it's happening to everybody. 
Just yeah. because you're concerned, just because you're scared that, you have, that you're having wet dreams, it's okay. It's okay. So tell your friend he's perfectly okay. He's not a pervert. He's not an animal out of control. Okay, do you want to pass these out and leave them face down? A house in East End, Toronto. Here, the jokes, the ideas, even the issues in the show are all molded by a process unique to Degrassi. Okay, just before we start um, reading, we've had a lot of discussion. Would you just take a moment to forget who you are and remind yourself that you are a character, Degrassi Junior High, and let's begin reading. <laughs> Black and white. Outside of the school. Show titles and the kids arrive. Alexa and Michelle approach together. Linda Schuyler guides the players through the first reading of the script. They've been at their own real-life schools all week. Now, at this workshop, they find out what the show's producers and writers have been up to. What's in store for the fictional characters they play. It's, it's because I'm black, right? No, it isn't. They're not like that. They're just kind of overprotective. This episode's theme is interracial dating. Michelle has been asked to the graduation dance by BLT. Her parents object. After the read-through, the floor is open for the actors' reviews, and the pros pay careful attention as the kids say what they think. Um, okay, uh, do you believe that racism still exists today? Are we dealing with an issue, or are we dealing with a non-issue? <laughs> <laughs> who, who wants to pick that one up? At the end, you know, what she's doing right now, right. it's not really rebelling, in my opinion, because she doesn't stand up to her parents. Right. She's just going to hide it. Yeah. And it's not hard to do that. Maybe BLT if should she, say Maybe that. that would be the better thing to no, do. No, but if no, she was... Or well, she could end up standing up to him that way without me having to say anything. Yeah, but she's still like... No, that. and she goes, no, she and, and then BLT starts like, like she's okay, she's... That, I don't care. When we're at those read-throughs, Yan plays an incredibly crucial role. He's listening, he's writing, he hears how they say it in their own vernacular. It's just a wonderful example of the adult, the, the, the professional talents of an adult merging with the raw, open uh, emotions of the adolescent. They're adults. Kit, Linda, and Yan are... 30s, and they, um, <laughs> and you know, we're right there. We're in high school right now. In terms of script input, I think we have like a fresh perspective. We're living it right now, and we know what it's like. And we stop them from making it into the 50s all over again and going back to their own childhood. I could picture BLT at the end um, going to pick her up in front of her parents and dragging her. Well, not dragging her. <laughs> 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 Seven forty-five a.m. The Degrassi set. Fifteen minutes from first call and no time to spare. Most of these kids had never acted before Degrassi, and their freshness is part of the show's art. It's major league television, but the glamour, such as it is, is right out of basement theatricals. The guys will just—I mean—they'll brush their hair in the morning, and then maybe they'll just give a little quick brush when they get here. And the girls do their own makeup. We don't have our own makeup people because that's—it's looking phony. When you have, you know, like tons of makeup on, trying to make yourself and your hair all nice and hair sprayed, and when you look more natural, it's helping the show. All right, now, girls, don't anticipate the end of this scene. You're all going to be... I think a lot of the naturalism comes from the crew, that we, we work with a very small crew, and there isn't a lot of fussing. It's sort of seat of the pants. Okay, here we go. Roll sound, Irv. And we're right. 76, take three. Mark it. And that's good. And, and action, two. Michelle. We want to be polished. We don't want to be slick. And I think a lot of it comes with the performers. That we're very aware of them. And I get feedback from them all the time. And there's a lot of conversation that goes on. And, and, and you know, you can't be in, that involved in, with all those kids and not stay young. You, you know, you th you, we think the way they do a lot of the time. Oh, I don't want to make any deals because he has all the blocking properties. Between takes, the young actors catch up on their off-camera lives, cramming the normal pursuits of growing up into a few idle minutes. The grassy actors work an average of 10 days a month from May to December. It's a big chunk of time in a teenage life, and the set becomes a second home. In it, they're the family. We are continuing in the resource center 
So chances are the only people that are going to be used are the grade nines. Sari, who's our um, production manager and scheduler, it's a nightmare for her, scheduling around 52 different kids, having different sets of exams and different graduation nights and this and that. But she's brilliant at it. And I think that by her being able to do that and by us having a crew that will accommodate the kids' schedule, that they are living as much of, as possible the normal life of a teenager and not that of a movie star. <laughs> movie stars, for instance, don't get grounded for breaking rules, which can still happen in the private lives of these kids. Even on the job, as they admit, they're not always angels. When you have 52 kids, I mean, there's bound to be some trouble, some chaos, and sometimes I think the adults have got to look at that. I mean, if there were four kids, it would be a perfect set. Yeah. But it's just there's so many kids, we can't help it. I mean, we can't sit there quietly in the resource center all day. We know that they're at a stage of development where they have to push and push the system as far as they possibly can because that's your job as an adolescent. We're just kids, and mm -hmm. you're here to work, but we're also here to have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine my life before Degrassi. I mean, I was a real loner. I, I didn't hang out with people. But now, my social life is with the people here on set. I really enjoy hanging out with the people on set because I can be myself, we can have a great time and have fun, you know? Away from the classrooms, their real ones, as well as those of Degrassi Junior High, the actors get together and often swap old tales from their program's growing history. The day, for instance, when an underage Pat Mastroianni took a little joyride in the company van. Oh, no, Pat drove the van. Oh, give me a break, all right? <laughs> oh, no. It wasn't my fault, all right? I was so whose fault was it? was it? Look, it was your Favorite fault. Guy, okay, right? let's hear your side. Yeah. Everyone's in the van. Oh. Ten kids in the van, and, and someone dared me to put in reverse. So I passed. I looked around. Everyone's around. Sorry. <laughs> you, you, went, you, went, you didn't even go too far. I went about a meter. A foot and a half. A meter. You went about three centimeters. I drove a foot and a half. Siri just walks out. She walks out. Oh, I hear is. Wouldn't it be amazing to go for a drive? Yeah. The producers yeah. put Pat on probation for two weeks, but this is Degrassi, where art imitates life, Joey, and so, naturally, the incident became part of a show. Trust me. As always, there are consequences, and Joey, Wheels, and Snake soon learn the price of their prank. You're looking at 85 bucks. 85 bucks? Do you use, real, like, real stories? Like that really happened to you, or do they just, you know, like make them up or something? I mean, the close they... relationship between daily life and the show's stories strikes a chord wherever the cast goes. They get their ideas from teenagers. Of course, they get, they watch us a lot to get ideas. For young people, no matter where they live, the stories on Degrassi seem lifted from their own lives. In fact, sometimes the inspiration comes from the young actors' lives, as when Neil Hope lost his own father and months later played this scene. Mom and Dad, they're okay. Oh, Derek. Your mother and father, they're dead. No. They're dead. No. As my personal self, I have no. some experience in death with around, around myself. Every year, the kids were, all, were, were saying, we've got to have a, have a story about death, and we were reluctant to do it, because how, how do you begin to do it? Well, the obvious person to, to perform it would be Neil. Is that a good idea? Is it fair to him? Is he ready for it? And he was very enthusiastic about it. He wanted to do it. He had a lot of confirmations, suggestions. Um, when I lost my dad, I felt more sad than angry. I wasn't going to turn it down, because then I thought that it would be a good experience for myself to do it. 
And at first I was scared to go into filming of it for, I was kind of worried that I was gonna start thinking about my father again. And what was really weird when we were filming the funeral scene in the cemetery, I just looked at one of those caskets and you know, that's all I saw was my father laying there. And which I thought in a way it helped because then I was putting my emotions along with Wheel's emotions into it. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We realized that what we've done is we've created this world of Degrassi Junior High that exists beyond the screen. It amazes us sometimes it, it, when, when we look around and see what it is we've created. We've got Degrassi clothing, we've got t-shirts, we've got Degrassi books, we're gonna have Degrassi records coming out. I mean, Degrassi has become an adjective, the Degrassi experience. That experience means thousands of dear Degrassi letters from adults as well as kids. They seek advice or favors or just friendship so they sometimes miss an important point. There was this one girl, it was really funny. She is just turning 12 years old and she wrote to me from Vancouver. She said, well, would you like to come to my birthday party? You can bring your bodyguards. Bodyguards, I don't have me. <laughs> Some of the actors have become world famous, but star is a four letter word around Degrassi where it's the rep company that matters. Autograph parties, the players take turns. And in case anyone's head starts to swell, there are always the rushes. You see how my eyes are moving? Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, it, it showed awkwardness when, when you move your eyes a lot like that. So, but what's Joey being awkward about here? Oh. Oh, you caught me there. <laughs> but, I mean... As you feel the way then there are workshops called you. Coping with Success, sessions that emphasize that no actor works alone, that everyone in the cast is essential. When we did the workshops this year, one of the exercises we did was a support exercise, which was very physical. And out of that, we explained that Joey, for instance, is a very important character, but he couldn't survive on screen unless he had other characters who were supporting him. You need support to, to do that role. You can't do it by yourself. And I think they were trying to teach us, you know, that we need one another to make a good show. Oh. <laughs> Trust, that's what I like. It's okay. okay. It was kind of... You're listening to CKNW. We're coming to you from the downtown studios in Vancouver. Line one, go ahead to Amanda. Good morning, Amanda. Hi. Or may I call you Spike? Well, whichever you like. Yeah. Your story fascinates me. Amanda Steptoe is on a cross-Canada tour promoting a book about her character, Spike. Hey, guys. The story of strong-willed Spike Nelson and her pregnancy was one of the most popular episodes on Degrassi. In it, Amanda's portrayal of a pregnant eighth grader was so convincing that some fans offered to send her clothes for the baby. Is it the baby? Call my mom. Quick! Line 9, you wanted to speak with Spike. Hi. Am I talking to you? Yeah. To some viewers, Amanda is Spike, which sometimes puts her on the spot. Do you think you should be before you start to have sex? Um, I think it depends on the person, really. Like, poor uh, Amanda, she's constantly asked, you know, are you really pregnant? What's it like? I mean, a lot of the fan mail says to her, I really like my boyfriend very much. Should I have sex? And we tell the kids, you're not teen counselors. She can't really tell you what it's like to be a 14-year-old who has to go home and tell her parents that she's pregnant. That's what scares me, is that, is that the audience sometimes expects the kids to have knowledge about their characters that they don't have in real life. I'm divorced, and I want to, I want to make sure I sort of understand my son and as he grows up. And Yet some parents find show. Amanda and the show help them understand their own teenagers. Well, I'm glad that you're older and you like the show because it is aimed at everyone, not just generally. Oh, I would think more parents should watch the show because... It brings up questions that a parent or a child wouldn't bring up themselves. If I was watching it with my mom and I was 13, I'd, after watching it, you could kind of turn, get into a conversation about it, but otherwise it was like you wouldn't mention it. Because I think a lot of parents are lost. They don't know what kids are thinking, what they're doing, what they're talking about. And I think Degrassi is helping the parents as well as the kids to help open up. 
Amanda Stepto, thank you very much for coming into the studio today. It's been a delight meeting uh -huh. Spike. I now, I now know what that hair is all about. Grassy Junior High is now subtitled or dubbed in more than 30 languages. Voglio dire proprio strani, come se quando ti svegli perdi. Polluzione notturna? From a single Canadian classroom, Yick and Arthur's adolescent traumas have become an international talking point. From Iceland to Asia, the language of the dialogue is less important than the humanity and the honesty of the story. All of these experiences, I think, are universal. So the kid in China will, of course, enjoy the, uh, those weird Canadian things, but I think the kid will relate to the fact that Arthur doesn't know where, to, where his dog's going to live, or Spike doesn't know what to do with the baby, and uh, Wheels doesn't know what to do about his parents. I don't have any ambition that we're on that kind of mission that we're going to stop all kids from taking drugs and no kid is going to have any kind of sex unless it's safe sex after having watched Degrassi. I think our biggest mandate is to present kids with alternatives for behavior and then it's still up to them which way they're going to choose. But let them make life choices. Now Degrassi's remarkable success has shown it can be done by a family, one that pays attention to its youngest members and treats them with respect. A revolution? Maybe not. But the fantasy world of teenagers on TV is growing up. Wake up in the